All right. Uh, thanks, everyone. Uh, it's Friday, end of KubeCon. I have this last session, so thank you all uh, for joining us. Yeah, it's been a great KubeCon. Um, so thanks for coming to talk about multi-cluster and the things that we're doing in the SIG. I am Jeremy Olmsted thompson I work on uh, 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 Google Kubernetes Engine, and I'm one of the co-chairs of SIG multi-cluster. And uh, I'm Stephen Kitt. I'm an engineer at Red Hat, where I work on lots of things multi-cluster. <laughs> And so today we're going to be talking about what this SIG is about, as usual for a SIG intro talk and telling you about our next problem spaces, uh, current activity as well, uh, which is a bunch of things, SIG MC website, uh, cluster sets and namespace sameness, so that's not really current activity, but it's one of the staples of our SIG. Uh, the About API, multi-cluster services API, um, and some new building, blo building blocks for orchestration, the uh, inventory. API, and of course, a call to action at the end, how to contribute. So what is the SIG about? It's about Kubernetes. Uh, it's about many Kubernetes. No, uh, really, it's uh, multi-cluster is everywhere, right? And I'm, you're all here uh, because you have an interest in multi-cluster, and you know that increasingly over time, we see more and more uh, multi-cluster is becoming important to basically everyone in the Kubernetes community and for those of us who build platforms for all of our customers um, for so many reasons, right? I mean, the obvious one is fault tolerance. You want to deploy, uh, you know, across multiple regions, multiple data centers, or even multiple clouds. Um, but we're seeing more and more reasons as well. You know, policy is a big one. You've got data locality. You need to deploy workloads where your data lives. Or you've got some other policy that prevents you from, uh, from you know, moving something out of an on-prem data center into the cloud or makes you otherwise split your workloads. And Kubernetes wasn't really built to stretch across, you know, massive geo uh, locations. So uh, multiple clusters is the way to do this, uh, especially now, uh, you know, as, as many of us are getting into AI ML um, and starting to focus more on accelerators and other thing that's popping up is capacity, right? Uh, GPUs are scarce. You want to be able to deploy your workloads, you know, where you can find capacity. That's another really important reason for, for getting into multi-cluster uh, so that you can kind of stretch those things around. This is hard, and why we have this SIG uh, is because Kubernetes was built kind of to manage everything, right? Like a cluster really kind of is the end of the universe. Uh, everything that you deploy, everything that your workloads depend on, uh, historically has been contained within a cluster. And anything outside of the cluster, you know, Kubernetes natively, is, is kind of a black box. Like it's opaque IPs, and you have to kind of build your own um, connectivity. You, you lose out on the metadata that you have uh, for those workloads. And so we've made a lot of progress in kind of breaking down these walls, uh, and we'll talk about that, but there's still a long way to go. And I think most importantly, this SIG is about all of you and your needs. Uh, everything we try to do, uh, we've been trying to build based on real concrete needs, not trying to you know, reach out to build these you know, ultimate flexible systems. We want to we wanna focus on concrete use cases and stitch those together to build the flexibility that we really need. So we need all of you to come you know, tell us today after this talk, come to our meetup on the forum, on Slack, um, and tell us about your needs, your real use cases, the things you're building, the things that you want to build or don't know how to build, um, and the things that we're doing that don't really fit your needs and, and when we need to make some changes. Um, so a little bit about our approach. Uh, so this is kind of a, a, we had a reset a few years ago and, and really want to focus on APIs. Because what we realized is, especially when you're stretching across platforms, you know, on-prem, cloud, multiple clouds, um, it's a very e diverse ecosystem, right? There's a lot of different uh, pieces that go into a deployment um, on, on each cloud, and, and not everybody does things the same way. Um, so by focusing on APIs, we leave room underneath uh, for customization so that implementations can, you know, tweak things in the way that, that works best for them. It could be, you know, sometimes you've got a central controller, you want to push configuration out. Sometimes on some clouds or some environments you might have, you might want to pull configuration in. You know, we want to support all of these models. Um, we want to avoid solving the optional problems, right? For me, um, this could be useful, is, is, has always been like a bit of a fly trap, right? Like I want to build, I want to build the solution that's going to solve all the problems. Um, but sometimes you end up you know, getting caught up on things that don't really matter. You can spend a lot of time debating some feature that isn't really core to the problem you're trying to solve, right? So we, we started out kind of trying to solve maybe too broad of a problem space. And in the last few years, we've really been trying to focus on like, what are the minimum set of APIs we have to define to make things work? 
consistency with existing APIs. This is important because nobody starts with multi-cluster, right? You learn Kubernetes, you get your deployment working, and then you want to spread it out. Um, so making sure that when you do that, it's not starting over, uh, things work the way you'd expect is really important. And lastly, composable building blocks. We don't all have the exact same problems. And so we want to make it so that you can, you know, take the pieces that work for you and put them together into a, a bigger system and you don't have to worry about everything else. So one of the things that we've added in recent years has been the uh, SIGMC website to try and make our work more visible. Uh, and you can find that at, at uh, multicluster.sigs.kates.io. And it provides higher level documentation. And again, as Jeremy said, we focus on APIs and APIs that are really for end users. And so this is supposed to provide higher level documentation for end users. Also project status updates, although we haven't really been very good at that. Uh, <laughs> and uh, ultimately we'd like it to be able to connect implementers to our APIs and tooling and to also catalog implementations for end users because there's lots of implementations of all the different building blocks, uh, different levels of support and so on. And we'd like that to be visible. Uh, and obviously we also would like to know what we're missing, uh, what you trying to do multi-cluster if you are, would like to find out from uh, our website, whether that's uh, good patterns of practice for multi-cluster deployments, how you actually use this stuff, uh, and open questions for future developments. And real quick, as, as Stephen said, we haven't always been good about the updates. So we are looking for someone to maintain uh, the website. If anybody is interested, you know, talk to us or join us uh, uh, online. But we'd, we'd love somebody to kind of take ownership and help us drive that and make it more regular. So with that, I'll shift into the stuff we've actually been building. So starting, I guess this isn't something we've really built, but this is, the, I'll talk about the cluster set. And what a cluster set is, is it's not an API, it's a concept. But it's the concept that we've based our, uh, our building blocks on. And it's basically a set of clusters um, that are working together uh, with some important characteristics. So first, uh, the set of clusters need to be governed by some kind of common authority. This could be a team or a person or an organization, uh, but some entity that has uh, the authority to make strong statements about multiple clusters uh, and all the clusters that work together so that we can, we can make assumptions uh, when talking to these clusters. There needs to be some degree of trust between these clusters. If you never want these clusters to have any knowledge that the other clusters exist, they're probably not uh, in a cluster set. If it would be a major security breach, if, if any application in one cluster found out about the existence of some service, even if it couldn't talk to it in another cluster, like maybe this isn't uh, the best thing to combine in the same cluster set. Um, but this doesn't mean that they, you know, all your services need to talk to each other. It just means that you know, it is within that organization. Um, the most important piece of a cluster set is namespace sameness. And this is a principle that a namespace with a given name uh, in, a, uh, in one cluster uh, is the same namespace uh, as a namespace with the same name in another cluster. And that means you know, used for a common purpose, uh, common access. And basically, if I can talk to a uh, namespace in one cluster, I can talk to that namespace in another cluster. Um, and they, they're not used for wildly different uh, purposes. So we can make some strong assumptions about how they're used. And this helps us kind of elevate the identity um, uh, that comes with namespaces above the cluster so that clusters can come and go and those assumptions still hold. Um, a namespace doesn't need to exist in every cluster. Um, you know, you don't need a namespace foo in every cluster in the set. Doesn't mean that I need to be able to talk to every cluster in the set um, or have access to that namespace. Uh, but if a namespace exists in a cluster, it should behave the same as, as it does in any other. Um, so with that, we just need to figure out how to identify these clusters, because Kubernetes doesn't have any built-in way to actually name a cluster. Yeah, in fact, more than that, as Jeremy said earlier, since in Kubernetes the cluster is the universe, there isn't actually a representation of a cluster as such. Uh, and so uh, the About API is a, a way to start changing that. Um, it's a simple um, CRD, just a key value store, with some uh, well-known keys, and they'll allow you, allow you to tell that, that well, to, to identify that a specific cluster is named this way. So here we have clusters A, B, C, and D, um, and that's a well-known property that is supposed to be present in every cluster uh, with a, the about API. And, and we also are told that it, which cluster set it belongs to, 
so in this case, it's all my org. So it, this means that in theory, all these clusters can talk to each other, and therefore you can also expect that uh, the different namespaces, where they're available across different clusters, will be the same and provide access, access to the same services. And you can also use the About API to add other fields that are of interest. So there can be this could be in implementers, uh, well, uh, according to implementers' requirements, or just to your use cases. A bit like labels in a way, I, uh, I suppose, you know, with their environments here, for example. Uh, network foo and compliance secure. Um, and so just in a little more detail, this is KEP 2149. It's currently in, uh, in beta. And it's a cluster scoped uh, cluster property CRD. Like I said, just a very simple key value store. Uh, and we have so predefined well-known keys for the cluster ID uh, and the cluster set it belongs to with requirements on well, uh, Unicity. So a, uh, a given cluster with a given name can only exist once inside a cluster set. Uh, and also, a given cluster can only be part of one cluster set. And that's a very simple building block for higher level of orchestration. That's all it is. And so on top of that, we can build other things, starting with body cluster services. So this was actually the first uh, of the kind of new round of APIs uh, we built around the cluster set. Uh, but it does build on the about API. We started with multi-cluster services and then kind of worked back to identity. But it is, you know, as you'd expect, uh, a tool for connecting uh, services across clusters in a flexible way, um, or even deploying a single service with backends in multiple clusters. And really the goal here is to separate a service producer from a service consumer so that service consumers and producers don't really need to care about where each other is located. And they could be in the same cluster or different clusters. Um, that flexibility is up to you and your needs and can change over time without having to coordinate. And so how it works is really simple. Um, you have a service, a normal Kubernetes service, uh, headless or cluster IP, and you create a service export. And the service export uh, has the same name as the service you want to expose in the same namespace. And now that service becomes accessible from other, cluster, or other clusters uh, in basically the same way that you'd consume a service within that local cluster. And so, you know, as we talked about our approach, we started with you know, a focus on the API. I think looking back, we probably originally started over-specifying things. We tried to get too much detail. We got caught in that, in that fly trap. And over time, we've kind of walked back a little bit and really focused on the core pieces that matter. So it, it ends up being a very, very simple API. But you, know, you can use a variety of implementations. Uh, some of them are listed here. And, uh, and connect the services between clusters very easily. Um, one of the neat traits about this is that we built it such that consumers only ever need to rely on local data, so we minimize the amount of cross-cluster coordination you need to do. Uh, but the end result is that uh, cluster IP and headless services across clusters basically just work uh, like they do um, in a single cluster. And one of the really uh, you know, interesting ways you can use this is you know, if you think you might grow into multi-cluster or uh, you know, need some additional degree of, degree of fault tolerance, you can actually use uh, multi-cluster services in a single cluster. And then uh, as your service grows or your needs change, uh, you can spin up additional backends in a different cluster. Um, because if two services have the same name, like we talked about sameness, they're, they're part of the same service, right? So the backends can be shared. Um, or you could even move uh, the service to another cluster. And you never need to tell your consumer what's going on. You don't need to build that coordination. So that can make it a lot more flexible. And with that flexibility, we've actually partnered with uh, SIG Network and the new Gateway API. For those not uh, familiar, uh, Gateway is basically the evolution of Ingress um, and lets you define routes for you know, how to connect to uh, services from outside of a cluster. And uh, if you have a compatible implementation, you can actually point a gateway at a multi-cluster service and have multi-cluster backends uh, for your service in a way that works exactly like you'd expect uh, with a single cluster deployment. And so the next step from there, as you might imagine, is getting into orchestration. And so, so far, everything we've said has really just been objects that are inside a single cluster. And you only know about that single cluster. About API tells you what your cluster is called and whether it's part of a cluster set or not. And then the MCS services API allows you to export services. And there's something somewhere that allows you to transparently consume services from other clusters. But you don't actually know that that happens. Um, and there, we're, we're working on a, a new API that will provide more visibility 
um, over all the clusters in the cluster set uh, with the idea then of, well, lots of use cases, but for example, uh, orchestration. And so this, this has come up from uh, so another one of those APIs where we've done things in the past that haven't really worked out, and so we're walking back. First, there was the cluster registry. Uh, then there was KubeFed that actually got some use, but it was too ambitious uh, and development stalled. And there, but there is actual demand for uh, all this stuff. So how do we solve it? And so we've, we're working on um, a simpler, hopefully, API called the Cluster Inventory API. And this is driven by a number of uh, projects and groups uh, who are involved in the SIG. Uh, but this is still at the stage where we are sketching things out, working out the details. So it is, now is the opportunity, now is the time for you, if you're interested in this stuff, to get involved uh, and help us avoid make, making more mistakes. <laughs> and uh, most importantly, help us avoid uh, setting something in stone which doesn't really meet your requirements. Because obviously, we hear a lot from people in the SIG who are interested in this uh, sort of field already, but who are aligned with the way uh, the SIG works. What, what we would really like to know is all those, those of you who've maybe looked at this work and decided it's not for you because it doesn't quite match. If you don't tell us why, then we can't fix that. Um, yeah, and so uh, in a little more detail on the cluster inventory API, um, this is a way for uh, clusters to discover, or things running inside a cluster, or things with access to information about a cluster to discover what all the clusters that are in the cluster set are, uh, and properties about them. Um, so this will be, for example, their API endpoints. Uh, at this KubeCon, we've had discussions around uh, credentials as well, so that you could take this cluster inventory and use it to actually access uh, all the clusters. Um, it could be information about the sizes of the clusters, the equipment that's available in them. You know, Jeremy mentioned AI workloads, for example. You could say that there's a specific cluster that has lots of GPUs, and so an orchestration system would move workloads uh, that want those there. Um, but like I said, we're still discussing this a lot, so we'd, we're really interested in um, possible uses for this. Uh, and so what's next in general for the SIG? Uh, canonical patterns. We mentioned that we'd like to describe that on the website, but we've got all these building blocks, and they're fairly basic so far. And what, what we'd like to know is how you use them, uh, how they should be used, or well, try to figure out how they should be used, uh, and as a result of that, are there patterns and workflows that we could highlight as best practices that other people coming into the field, uh, dipping their toes into the multi-cluster waters, can use to avoid making their own mistakes? And then uh, one that's been on our mind for a while now, but now that we're starting to have more of these building blocks, I think is becoming increasingly important, is uh, things like leader election, right? How do you, if you're going to build controllers that span multiple clusters, uh, you need some way to coordinate, right? Um, it'd be, I, we're very interested in anyone in the community who wants to come help us design this as well, especially now that we're starting to shape up things like the cluster inventory and have some discovery building blocks. Uh, we wanna use them and take them to the, to the next level. Um, and then, you know, as we keep saying, this is about you, right, and your use cases. So uh, what else do we need? Uh, what's missing? Uh, there's a lot here. You know, in the past, we've, we've had people come talk about storage and what that can mean in a multi-cluster context. Um, uh, we know that there's uh, been conversations, uh, we've had lots of conversations about identity, um, you know, and extending that and uh, authorization. So uh, there are lots of areas. Basically, every part of Kubernetes at some point is going to need some awareness of multi-cluster operation. And so we need your help to figure out what's next. So uh, please come get involved. Yeah, be part of the SIG. Uh, you've probably heard that from lots of SIGs, right? <laughs> all, all SIGs are uh, uh, thirsty for more, uh, more participation to find out what things are actually uh, of use. So we would like to know what you're working on, uh, what tools you're building or you've built, because we know that lots of, uh, well, lots, not necessarily lots, but there are people doing multi-cluster on their own. And so they've built their own tools. 
we'd like to find out what those are like. You know, you don't have to reveal all your secrets, but just to sort of what you've learned from things and the, how you go about it. Um, and then, of course, the tools that you're missing, the problems that you and your customers have, um, and whether you have specific needs that aren't addressed at all, uh, or only partially, perhaps. Uh, and if you need help or if you want to help, yeah, and we've had, uh, we've had a number of people uh, come and just basically do demos, right? Just come with a, a deck or a video and tell us what you're working on and, you know, uh, just share, share your learnings. Yeah, and so some specific ways that we know that you could, well, that anyone could help with the SIG that aren't, there isn't a huge, huge barrier to entry is just add information to the website. The website is so basic that, for example, the About API which is a very simple API, has an empty web page. <laughs> so if you, if you feel like uh, helping out with that, that's, that would be an easy one to do. And another big one is contribute to the test suite because th we've got a number of APIs in progress that we've been discussing, but none of them are GA yet. Yeah, not even the about API. Uh, and <laughs> we'd actually like, it, like that to change. Uh, and so one of the big uh, missing pieces is a conformance suite so we'd like help on the, the test suite. And that's also where um, implementations can be confronted. So, you know, because once we have a, a conformance suite, that bakes in the hidden assumptions behind the API. So if you want your solution to be conformant, it's best to get involved when the conformance suite is being developed. So yeah, come come share your use cases. Um, I think on that previous side, we also probably deleted a couple bullets accidentally. But uh, yeah, come come give a talk. Uh, send us links uh, to project pages. Um, here you can find all the information uh, uh, to contact the SIG. We meet every other week um, at uh, nine thirty uh, Pacific time, uh, sixteen thirty UTC. Um, uh, come join us in person and, and chat with us. Uh, uh, we hope to see you there. Um, and now we'd love to actually hear from you uh, in real life. Yep, so there's a microphone in the middle there at the front for people who have questions. Hi, uh, thank you for the talk. I had uh, one question, sorry. I just... Yeah, so you talked about that consumer on one of the slides uh, in the beginning, that consumers only ever rely on local data can you describe what you mean by that? So are you saying that if, for example, I'm at the cluster A, I don't need to know, for example, the, the endpoints of the cluster B? You, you do need to know the endpoints, but the way we've designed this is uh, under the assumption that those endpoints will be uh, imported by the, by the implementation into the cluster um, that is uh, consuming. Uh, so when you actually talk to those endpoints, that list is local. You're not trying to do like an on-demand fan out. Multi-cluster services API, I think, is like really quite an elegant uh, solution, and it's, I was wondering what the, the status is uh, of it. Is, is it likely to the API will change, and we're still figuring it out, or it's just the conformance testing that you were outlining earlier? Like, what's the status of that, and when could we expect possibly maybe uh, GA? Um, yeah, I'm sorry that it's not GA. I'll start there. Um, we will. <laughs> yes. Um, uh, there may be some small changes we've been discussing, but small. The core implementation isn't going to change. The general workflow, create the service export, discover the service import, that's, that's not likely to change at this point. In fact, um, some of the uh, implementations listed here are, including uh, GKEs that I work on, are GA, uh, like already, despite the, the state of the API. So, um, you know, likelihood of, of, change, of drastic change is very, very low. Um, but we, we do need to work on uh, getting it uh, officially GA in the community. And, and we have been discussing that a lot uh, the, while we're here, so um, soon. Yeah, Thank you. So maybe a little more specifically, uh, it's safe to assume that the service export object is going to stay as is. Um, so, uh, because, well, so all you need to know when you're a user consuming this uh, API is if you, you create a service export object, 
Uh, and at some point in the near future, you will then be able to access the service using clusterset.local. And so that's how you create it and that's how you consume it. That's not going to change. Uh, the service import mechanism is probably not going to change either, the endpoint slices and so on. It's, it's going to be probably more details on whether where uh, IPs are, IP addresses are required in the objects and what the guarantees are on those, whether they're, because different imp implementations have different reliance, reliance on virtual IPs or not, that sort of thing. Yeah. Great, thanks so much. Absolutely. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> with the namespace sameness from, uh, position statement, I've heard from customers and vendors that while it is really nice in an ideal state, there are often folks who need some sort of way to carve out an exception for like one or two namespaces that maybe should not be replicated and have that strong thing, even though they might be the same name on two different clusters. Um, I have concerns about doing that in a loose, unstructured way, because then like particularly as a mesh implementation, you lose a lot of the like strong guarantees that you can build around for things like failover. Um, but I'm curious if you've seen over in the network policy working group, there is a NPEP proposal for a tenancy group object that would be able to group namespaces uh, in a way that seems like it might be useful for this problem. And I'm curious if you've seen that and have any thoughts on that. Um, so I haven't actually seen that yet, so now I will definitely check that out. But I, I want to call out that I missed something important with namespace sameness. So, this namespace should not be the same in any cluster is also a valid you know, type of namespace sameness, basically that a namespace should be considered cluster local and not have any broad exposure. And then there's actually another kind of area that I, I know that we, when implementing it, um, uh, have, have faced as well, which is the kind of the transition phase, right? Like if you're coming from a single, from a disparate group of single clusters and you want to expose multi-cluster, you need some way to kind of gradually opt in. Um, so uh, the the goal is that, you know, the that's not a, a steady state. Like I think um, it's fine if you want to have your dev namespace in every cluster and it actually belongs to different people, as long as it's never, you know, accidentally treated as a, a global namespace and you have a way to, you know, have your implementation exclude that. Um, but ideally, long term, you don't have a situation where you've got namespace foo in five clusters uh, that is the, you know, canonical namespace foo, and then there's this other cluster that just has a namespace foo that's named the same way but totally works differently, and, you know, because that's just, in many ways, a risk waiting to happen. I also want to add the worst possible outcome, I think, would be to have one service whose name was foo in one cluster and bar in a different one. Like yes. Kind of those things would be a, a no -no. Right. Exactly. So, so you know, names are really important, and so I think you know, trying to maintain that as best as possible. Yeah, I think uh, maybe another way of thinking about that for people who are not entirely familiar with all this discussion is that the the, the namespace idea, namespace sameness idea, is about the philosophy of multi-cluster, which is that we extend things across clusters. Lots of people tend to think of multi-cluster as a way to do point-to-point -point services make service foo on cluster A available in cluster B as maybe something else. That's not what multi-cluster multi is about. There is, you, you do end up with point-to-point -point connectivity for services, but it's a result of the philosophy of multi-cluster. Hello. So my question is about digging more in detail. So I'm making service-to-service -service communication between multi-cluster. So is the communication is getting through the QBPI itself? And if so, uh, the configuration and the secret for that cluster, how it's shared and how where it's uh, exactly stored. Um, so the so the actual mechanism is uh, is implementation dependent, um, but uh, most of our implementations tend to kind of work in a way where uh, it all continues to use the existing data plane. So they end up, or several of our which implementations, I won't say most, because we have mesh, which of course is a different uh, uh, connectivity uh, path, but um, the idea is that this is more about service connectivity. I think if you want authentication between services, things like that, that's higher level. That's where the mesh might, might take over. Traditional services have a problem with the secondary networking, and I think that is being addressed as we speak. Uh, when you do multi-cluster, 
services to also include secondary networks from Spark? Um, we don't yet uh, because that's being uh, tackled now, but we did kind of design it with the hope of multiple uh, addresses uh, behind the services in case you wanted to be able to do that or dual stack. So the, you know, the hope was to be flexible, but I believe right now um, uh, we, I'm, I'm not sure if any of the implementations have, have uh, multi-network support. But, but it's part of the, it's, it's part in the, the plan. So Absolutely, that's, yes. That's So we are doing our uh, clusters as cattle, uh, not pets, so that means that we have many smaller clusters, um, but it also means that when we were to want to say rotate a cluster out or have a cluster set, uh, we are using EPS Istio, so that makes it a little bit easier. Uh, right now what we have to do is duplicate everything, we don't do any federation, we don't do any meshing connectivity, and we just build some jargon, so we just say, copy everything you know and copy all this other thing and there you go and then you switch your load balancer manually and then you terminate the other cluster. This would essentially eliminate all of that just by using a cluster set dot local essentially because then it doesn't matter how many clusters there are because they could in theory all use the mesh because it would be multi-cluster service aware it would be the implementation I suppose uh, of that multi-cluster service. Right. I mean, you still need to get your configuration in each of those clusters, of course. But the yeah, the idea is that um, you know if your mesh supports uh, multi-cluster services uh, and uh, you know optionally with gateway, um, you can you know bring up a new cluster, uh, expose the service in that cluster, and it's just kind of added to the backends uh, for that service. Then you tear down your existing cluster if you want, and the service has moved, or you leave them both up for uh, um, for distribution. But you don't need to do you know that kind of rolling update. It, there's machinery that can handle that for you. Yeah, yeah. So as a use case for as essentially the same, this would be a good match. So that's good to know. And this also pretty much rolls into the next one: is uh, what about version compatibility? Is there anything uh, about that, or is it just going to be based on, say, the CRD revision? So this is so. Um, it really is the the Kubernetes service layer. So there's no real versioning built into that either. I think for versioning the best solution right now is probably either, uh, you know, use gateway to um, shift your traffic, or if you're using a mesh and it has capabilities there, that, that can be an option as well. Oh yeah, and I was also more thinking along the way of say the version of the control plane, so you have a uh, 129 and a 130, for example. Got it, yeah, so that actually, uh, the m most implementations I'm aware of, or all of them, don't really care about uh, control plane version, so you can bring up a new cluster version. Actually, this is a really great way to do like blue-green upgrades. So you bring up a new cluster version, add the backends. When you're happy that everything's working, tear down the old one, and your service has just moved. Basically, you've, you've upgraded without downtime. And, That's uh, exactly what it was yeah. after, right? blue-green, but for your entire cluster, or, yep. or multiple clusters, or multiple cluster sets, you, know, you never know where you end up. Yep. Well, you don't get the cluster set set. Or, <laughs> 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 yeah. <laughs> there, there's always another layer. <laughs> Yeah, that was actually something I was thinking well, when, when I was talking there. Uh, we've added a representation of the cluster, but we still don't have a representation of the cluster set. <laughs> and then that's going to be the next universe. At some point you're going to have a multiverse. And <laughs> yeah, you know it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So uh, before multi-cluster services, like service mesh was another way of uh, doing multi-cluster connectivity between services. And now that, the, I guess this isn't really your problem, but I'm curious, like, now that there's a Kubernetes native way of doing this, uh, will service mesh implementations align with that API or will it be totally separate or is there work to get a standard way of expressing that intent or? That's exactly the hope. And you see Istio is one of the named implementations. So like we've got, you know, compatibility there. I think, you know, yeah, the hope is that uh, this will make it easier to gradually adopt a mesh as well, right? Because if you start using Kubernetes native services or Kubernetes native multi-cluster services um, and you uh, want to adopt a service mesh, we want, you know, keeping with that consistency, it should be something you can adopt without starting over in your configuration. And then, and then I guess uh, the next step is uh, gamma and gateway and then everything just becomes uh, the one API to rule them all. <laughs> yeah, I, <laughs> exactly. 
Yeah, 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 networking. Um, I want to throw down a harder challenge. When is storage coming? I really want storage to come. I think the, the I, you know, I, I won't throw it back to you specifically. I'll throw it back to all of you. I think we need help. Uh, we need help understanding what multi cluster storage means to you. We had actually a demo um, in the SIG. Um, if you look back in the history, we had uh, someone come and show a demo of you know, what it would be like to move storage between clusters. It was really, really exciting. Um, but there's more to it than that, and so we need help. I think, I think we have one minute, so yeah, go for it. Uh, so I'm mostly involved in the Selim project. We've heard a lot about it. Uh, seems to me the concept of cluster set is very similar to the cluster mesh. If you, yeah, so there's already an issue on like supporting multi-cluster services, which I think is great. If I remember correctly, they are mostly um, like hesitant and maybe worried about like scaling issues with with exactly what I asked uh, the first question. If I somehow need to like copy all the endpoint informations from cluster B to cluster A, and there's a high pot churn, and I have, let's say, hundreds of clusters, I am afraid that it's gonna like hit hard on the on the API server. So, so this is actually really exciting because we had a lot of conversations about this, um, and we've actually we don't require that you copy the endpoints. We just require that there's connectivity. So if an implementation found that it was better for scalability reasons not to actually have real endpoint slices, that's okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, that's, yeah, I think that's better. Thanks. M more, more excitingly, I think you don't have to copy all of the endpoints. Yes. Yeah. If yeah, there can be horizons. A lot of them, you can copy some of them enough to satisfy the condition and then you can over time adjust. Right. Yeah, there's a lot of flexibility here. And, and that's also assuming that you have like an underlay where your pods can actually talk to each other across it. If you don't have that assumption, you could instead expose like an east-west load balancer at that same point and accomplish the same thing without doing that. that yep. Yeah, we yeah. wanted to leave flexibility for all of those choices. Yeah. But we've really run out of time. So <laughs> We're, we're expecting all of you uh, the next SIG call <laughs> to continue the discussion. <laughs> Thank you so Thanks. much.